Today's presenters will be Rachel Mobedorf, Sean Gary, and Judith Langnick, all from ABCAM. Rachel gained her knowledge in IP during her PhD at University of Geneva in Switzerland. Rachel is a principal scientist at ABCAM and has set up IP in our lab. This assay allows the laboratory to routinely test our own antibodies in this fantastic technique. Sean received his PhD at University College Dublin and spent countless hours trying to IP various kinesis involved in mitotic progression. Following this, Sean transitioned to a postdoc at Cambridge University, where he carried on trying to identify proteins involved in a checkpoint throughout both yeast to hybrid and IP. Finally, Judith will be joining us today. Judith completed her molecular biology degree and her PhD at University of Dundee. Upon completion of her PhD, Judith moved to the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge. Judith joined AppCam in 2011 and is a product manager. And now, I would like to turn the presentation over to my colleague, Rachel. Welcome to our webinar. In this section, I will give you a short introduction to IP. I will then talk about how to set up an IP experiment and how to find the perfect antibody, how to bind the antibody to the beads. I will talk about antibody titration and how to choose a secondary reagent for IP Western blot. Even though this is an advanced IP webinar, I thought we would start with the question, what is IP? IP is a technique used to enrich or purify a specific protein from a complex mixture, for example, an extract, using an antibody. What can you do with IP? You can isolate a protein from a complex mixture to then use in other assays. It can also be used to concentrate the protein. For instance, if your protein is expressed at very low level, IP might be required to visualize it in Western blot. Or you can determine protein-protein interactions in so-called co-IP. In this technique, the protein of interest is immunoprecipitated, and you then check either by Western blot or mass spec if other proteins were co-purified with your protein of interest. In the next slide, you can see a typical IP Western blot. This is an IP we performed in our laboratory using an antibody specific for TBP, the TATA binding protein. The bands created by TBP are highlighted by the red square. You can see a nice enrichment of TBP in the IP in line 3 compared to the extract in lane 1. This blot contains all the typical IP Western blot controls. I just want to t talk you through these IP Western blot controls. The first lane is the extract or input, the starting material. This is loaded on the gel to determine if the target can be detected in the starting material. This is not always the case, as sometimes enrichment by IP is required to visualize the protein. The second lane is a fraction of the supernatant after the immunoprecipitation. This is loaded on the gel to determine if the target protein has been depleted from the extract during the immunoprecipitation, and it will tell you how efficient your immunoprecipitation was. The third lane is the immunoprecipitation so the outcome of the experiment. If the IP was successful and efficient, this band should be enriched compared to the extract. The fourth lane is a sample where the immunoprecipitation has been performed with an isotype control antibody. So an antibody of the same isotype as the one used in IP, but not recognizing the target protein. This control is important as it will tell you whether the bands you see in IP are due to the antibody or due to its specificity for the target. The last lane is the beat control where everything but the antibody was added to the reaction. It is important to include this control in your experiment 
as it will tell you if there are bonds in your IP that are due to nonspecific binding of proteins to the beads. After this short introduction, I would like to tell you more about how to set up an IP experiment. The two most important steps in setting up an IP experiment are to find the perfect antibody. This is absolutely key. If your antibody does not work in IP, your experiments will not work. Once you've found the perfect antibody for your IP, you will need to determine the right testing conditions for your experiment. Let's start with finding the, right, uh, the perfect antibody. The best way to start is to check if there are any references in PubMed where an antibody has been used to IP or protein of interest by other researchers. Then you can use different antibody suppliers for an antibody that is tested in IP. On our data sheets, for instance, this would be noted in the tested applications here. Also check if there are customer reviews for IP. These are very helpful as they often give you a good idea on how well the antibody works. On our data sheets, these can be found in the app review section here. If there is no IP tested antibody available, these are the things you can watch out for. In IP, the target protein is usually in the native conformation. Therefore, an IP antibody needs to recognize an epitope on the exposed surface of the protein. Furthermore, as it is a pull-down reaction, the antibody also needs to have a high affinity for the epitope. So if you look for an antibody that works in IP, it is worth checking if the immunogen is on the exposed surface of the protein. You can only do this, though, if the structure of the target protein and the immunogen used to generate the antibody are known. Other good indicators for success in CHIP are if the antibody works in CHIP or immunohistochemistry, IHC, as these techniques have similar requirements for the antibody as IP. A question we often get is, should I choose a poly or a monoclonal antibody? Polyclonal and monoclonal antibodies can both be excellent IP antibodies, but they have different advantages and disadvantages. Monoclonal antibodies are specific to a single epitope, whereas polyclonal antibodies consist of a pool of antibodies that recognize different epitopes. The probability that the polyclonal antibody works in IP is therefore higher than that of a monoclonal antibody. But this does not mean that the monoclonal antibody will not work in IP. Monoclonal antibodies do have an advantage. Due to the nature of how they are made, they usually show minimal batch-to-batch -batch variation. Polyclonal antibodies are more prone to show batch-to-batch -batch variation as they need to be remade by immunizing another animal. We do extensive testing of each batch to ensure each new batch is comparable to the last one, but slight differences between batches are almost impossible to avoid. We have now covered how to find the perfect antibody and we'll discuss the next step, the binding of antibodies to beads. 